Well, um, growing up in a family where my dad was basically a musician, he used to play guitar and organs and all that kind of stuff. Um, I was always surrounded by music. They, they, was, they were always playing music in the house. And I grew up in, in the United States, in New York, actually. Um, so my, my first influences were kind of really contrasting because I was, I was into ACDC and I was listening to disco music because I had babysitters playing disco music in the house. So I had a real crazy combination of those music styles. And um, later on, when I was a kid, I completely fell in love with electronic music. And that was thanks to Depeche Mode. Um, I discovered them that I was like 13. And uh, that drove me all the way into um, producing dance music and um, obviously getting into uh, a facility like Bliss Corporation, where I then met Maori and Gabri and, you know, the, the, the rest of the guys in the band. Um, we were on the same, you know, uh, mental line of, of what music we liked and what kind of... Uh, um, products we were we were trying to work on so that kind of made it easier for us to actually combine our our talents and, and you know get to the point where something like Eiffel came up. That's awesome um, what, what were your first experiences of actually producing music and how did you learn? Well um, the first thing that I actually uh, got to see was a friend playing with the Commodore 64 and he had a keyboard and it was hooked up um, uh, via MIDI. And uh, I, I couldn't understand how the sound was coming out of the keyboard, but nobody playing it. And that was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Because um, I, I, I've always been madly in love with computers since I was seven years old. You know, like first time I got to see a computer, I was seven and I, and I just totally freaked out. As a geek as I am, you know, computers ha have always been my number one selection over anything, over girls, over whatever I could. If I could get my hands on a computer, I, then it was, I was happy. <laughs> so seeing this keyboard play without anybody playing it, and it was coming from the computer, totally knocked me out because it actually got me into the idea of having something like that at home because my dad wanted me to make music you know, study music since I was a little kid. Uh, but I, I, re I really didn't get into, you know, playing the guitar. I've always had something for a piano, but guitar was so hard for me. And I really never got into it. I needed that spark. So when the, the computer component came in, that's when I actually, you know, really jumped into learning music and starting getting myself into the production phase. And it all started out from there and it all carried out from there. And, and in terms of actually learning, you know, things like, like the keyboard, you know, did, did you learn to read or did you learn by, by listening to music? And, and... No, I actually went to school. I, I went to piano school because um, my, my dad had tried all my, all my life, you know, to, to get me into music and into yeah. studying music. And I was always saying, get that. I want to be a heart surgeon when I grow up. I don't want to be a musician. <laughs> and um, he was trying all the time, you know, giving me like, I, I, it was Christmas and I would find a guitar under the tree or uh, he would always take me to stores and say, look, look, look how nice this is and how this, this sounds and all that. And isn't that piano wonderful? So um, when I went to him and I said, Dad, I, I finally want to learn music. Um, uh, I, I want to play music. Can you buy me this? And he said, no, first you got to learn how to play. So um, I ran off to piano lessons and I was, I was speeding it up. It took me to get the things that I wanted, but then he finally got me that keyboard and that computer. And by that time, we were talking about an Atari ST1024, I think. Um, and that was my first computer that I had to produce music with. And the first keyboard was a Korg DW8000. And I was doing everything with these two keyboards. And uh, when I was a little kid, I got hit by a car. And uh, th th now this is a really weird story. I got hit by a car and, and we were in the United States and I ended up in front of the judge. And since that, um, I, I ended up in the hospital because of this. I got some insurance money out of it. And they put it away and I couldn't touch that money till I was 18. And I'm, we're talking something like 4,000 euros or something like that. Uh, so when I, when I turned 18, I, I finally had access to that money that I had totally forgotten about because it was like, I was like seven or eight when that happened. And I bought the first sampler with that money. So I, I grabbed that money and I bought the first sample. So my home situation was um, 
a keyboard, a DW8000 that was a synth and the master, the Atari ST1024, and an MX uh, sampler. And it, I did everything with that. I mean, the first songs that I did with that was with that. And that's, the, that's what I actually brought up to Torino when I started working at the Bliss Corporation. So I took everything from Sicily, put it in a box, and I went straight up to, to Turin. And I had my own little uh, little studio. So we actually blended it all into what was already there at the time. And that's how my professional career actually got started. That's awesome. In terms, in terms of the sampler, you know, stuff like that, like the kind of computer side of things, um because obviously keyboards uh, and, and music you know you learn learn school but in terms of using that type of gear was that just your inquisitive mind and your natural like love of computers and stuff that was my total love of music i was buying books to understand how media was was working um and not only about you know connecting the, the cables but actually the hardware part of it so um how it actually was put together and how it actually worked and that gave me a big head start compared to what happens today, like you just turn on a computer and everything is there. No one explains to you why it's there. Uh, but back in those days, you had to understand why it was there because you wouldn't know how to use it if, if not. Um, and that, that, that really got me excited because I was, I was starting to actually see the inside of it. And suddenly what looked like, you know, putting together a, a starship turned into, you know, like <laughs> it, it was like, playing a little game it wasn't that hard anymore and um that got me more and more into wanting to know of how computers were actually you know working with music and at that time you were not recording music audio speaking into computers you you were just using the computers to send midi signals to all your keyboards so you had to know what MIDI was all about, you know, musical instrument digital interface. And if you, if you say that to someone today, probably they don't know that that's what it means. Um, and all those codes and, you know, the, the pedal sustain and all that, you had to know that because you wouldn't know how to work out, the, you know, with the computer and all that. Uh, when we got into Bliss, when I got there, I, I, I was coming from Sicily when I was like um, 20 or 21. And I, I got into Bliss, and it was a miracle to me to actually, you know, meet other people, Maori or, or Massimo or Gabri, that actually knew those things as I did. Because down here, I was like almost alone. It was just, just me and another friend of mine. And um, that brought everything to a new level because it actually uh, it got blended with producing music and not only, you know, knowing how to actually write it into a computer. So... Um, it, it, it definitely grew on me more and more. And, and it's, I still do it today. You know, like I, I still spend hours on the internet uh, watching videos and tutorials about, you know, black magic color grading or simply how, you know, uh, cameras work. I have a black magic or so many pro and I, I do videos with that microphones and condenser microphones and uh, how uh, compressors work. It's amazing. If you really, you, you get to the basics of those, it is so much better when you produce. You have so much understanding about what you're really doing. And when you listen to something, then you know, then you could definitely just, you know, point your finger to one thing. And nine out of 10, you're going to be getting the result that you're looking for because you know that that's the kind of compressor that's going to give you that kind of vintage sound or a clean sound. Or maybe you want a distressor, you want something to distort it with. And being a geek really helps you out when you're producing. Yeah, well, I, I can imagine that it def, definitely would. Um, yeah. So in terms of in terms of Eiffel sixty five, you know, and, and and forming that, what would you say that you bring that you bring to the group um, versus you know the uh, the other guys? Um, what? How did you get? Um, you know, how was the blend of like personalities and stuff, and and what did you all bring uh, to the table? Well, uh, luckily for everyone in the band. Uh, Bliss Corporation has always been a place where you would like feel at home playing with your friends making music. So everybody in there had different abilities. I mean, Maori is an amazing uh, composer and a, and a piano player. And Gabri, he's a DJ. And, uh, and I was coming in as, as a singer and as a lyric writer. And I was also producing. And we were we were always mixing up with all the other guys in there. Uh, there were so many people working in and, and it was 
on an everyday basis, you're making a new project with somebody. Um, so we became friends. Uh, we were hanging out together long before our iPhone was even there. Uh, and um, always exchanging ideas and working on different projects and in combination with other people inside this. Massimo was helping us out. Uh, he, by the way, he's uh, one of the, the producers of, um, of Eiffel 65. And when we got to the idea of Blue, it, it actually came out of a, a tune that Maori was playing. He had this piano tune that, that was going on. Um, and Massimo was like, what is this tune? And Maori says, well, I, I like it, but you know, where are we going to push this? And Maori, Massimo was more into the idea of making it a dance track. And at that time, I was uh, working also in the studio, fixing the computers and you know, updating them and being sure that everything was up to date and all the programs were the same because there was, there was five or six studios at that time in, in Plus Corporation. And uh, I was updating motherboards. So I walk into the studio, Massimo goes, what are you doing? As well, I, I got to turn you guys off for like 10 minutes because I'm updating the motherboards. And he goes, no, 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 no just, just forget about everything. You got to listen to this track. And so Marty hits the play button and, and, and the piano blue starts playing. So we start working on that. And um, uh, we work together on the verse. Uh, well, and Marty goes, well, we're going to need lyrics. So I came up with three different lyrics. And um, we ended up choosing the most craziest one that actually... Uh, a lot of people think that it, it means sad, but it has a lot of a really bigger meaning behind that. Um, and so by the end of the day, I, I ended up improvising the intro of the song. Maori says, well, I'm going to need a, a rough uh, recording of you so that I can work on the track. And um, I, I recorded that. And by the way, that, that's what's on the record. I mean, I never re-recorded it. It was the rough recording and it ended up just being just as it is. Uh -huh. And he says, can you do something like improvising? Like, I don't know, something we can use in the beginning. And I completely improvised that part. It was not there. It was not even written at all. You know, that, yo, listen, up here is the story. That was not there. <laughs> so um, later on, Maui and Gabri work on the track on, you know, making it, on the arrangement and everything and have it mixed uh, by Angelica. And, and the record comes out like a whole lot of different tracks that we were working on back then. And it was 98, the end of 98. And then suddenly this, this track started, you know, growing on record shops and then it hit the radio and then it was like bang all over the place. And that what, that's what brought actually us three guys from being, you know, friends and workers to being iPhone 65. And that, yeah, I mean, that's uh, still, you know, you still hear that on the radio all the time uh, and clubs. And I know we, we, we still bug a lot of people with it. I know <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, a, lot too, of people, yeah. a lot of people love it. A lot of people don't know when it was released, you know, I think, because it's just it was nine, well, it in the night no every I mean, summer. And it's, it was 98. It was 98. It was the October 98 when it was released. And, I, and it actually became big in April 99. And so... so is it a, a huge um, source of pride or is it a source of frustration and pride or is it a source? Oh, no, frustration, um, I would not say so. I'm, I'm really proud of the track. I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm happy that yeah, it's turned out. You definitely should be. But, you know, some people will get a bit like when they have such monster hits that almost become like bigger than, than you know, the group. Do you know, like that song? No, no. I mean, song, we're, we're used to the idea of having it. music, you know, be bigger than you are. Um, well, you know, when you, you start making music, you barely never ask yourself that question. You do hope that something big happens, but you're not writing a track and you're saying, I hope that this is the one that, you know, becomes big and changes my life. You do it because you need to do it. Yeah. Um, and when it, when it really got big, at the time, we didn't know how big it was because we were in it. So, you know, you, you don't know how big a, a building is if you're in it. When, when you step out of the building, then you can see that like it's 140 floors. And it's like, oh, my God, we were in that. Um, I am so happy about the way things turned out. I mean, if I can go back in time, I would do everything exactly as, as we did it. Uh, it was hard. It was really hard in the beginning because we had no boundaries about, you know, rest or anything like that. Uh, but after all these years, seeing how many things Blue can actually do is is an amazing result. I mean, we're talking about opening the Iron Man 3 movie and so many remixes, Flume, 
uh, doing uh, yeah. a, a, new, a, you know, a new version of the song and uh, so many covers and Nia and I mean there's so many of them and, and they still keep on coming in people are still using it so I mean when it's like that and you understand that the song is way beyond what you are and when one day you're not going to be there then probably the song is still going to you know make somebody smile and it's still going to be part of somebody's life and maybe that person is going to pass it on to uh their son or their grandchildren i mean i have i have fans that are four years old and like oh, that's, that's crazy i mean blue came out 20 years ago the four-year-old kids of today should not know anything about blue <laughs> and it's crazy because you know uh, i mean like there's an italian version which is really cool and it's getting to so many kids that now we have a completely new fan base and it's like amazing and it's, it's, it's happening in Canada and the U.S. and in the U.K. And the more people are making remixes of it and the more it keeps popping out and the more little fans we have. And that is, that's an amazing result to, to get to, you know. Um, yeah, it's incredible. Why, sh why should that ever bring frustration? I mean, that, that's, that, that can only be a meaning of being proud of. Yeah, well, I, I do agree. But, you know, you do get some people who have such smash successes with their songs that sometimes they say oh you know i get tired of it or whatever um, no way but yeah i, I, I think you want something really crazy uh back in in 99 and in, in the era 2000 uh, we were really singing this song a lot i mean i'm, I'm talking about like 10 to, to 15 times a day it was it was amazing because we were on stage at night and doing tv shows in the day and you know doing the radios and all that uh, there were times when i was on stage and uh, I would just, you know, step out of my body and go back home for a minute. And I'm, I'm, I'm right there singing. So my body is in autopilot. It's like singing. And uh, I went back home and I'm thinking about, oh, I had to do this and I had to do that. And I forgot to do this and I forgot to do that. And this is all happening while I'm on stage and singing. And then all of a sudden, I, I realized that I'm on stage and I should be right there. So I, I just jumped back into my body. And I'm like, where in the song am I? And like for three seconds, I can't remember the words because I don't know where I am. <laughs> so the autopilot just went off and I'm like falling as a plane, out, you know, in, in the middle of the air. And I was like, oh my God, what's going on? So I, I just pushed the mic forward and the people start singing. So it's like, okay, this is where I am. And then I bring it back. But, but for like wow. two or three seconds, that, that would happen back then. So that, that was a really, really crazy, you know, like out of body experience, but it's, it's funny if you think about it yeah, yeah it's funny that's, that's amazing and what about move your body as well you know that's su that's such a great song um and you know that was for, that was obviously you know both were on 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 your first record Europop, which is which is right. such a classic yeah. um how how was move your body conceived of well um as i was saying in uh, in those days this corporation was made up of um a lot of producers singers you know engineers and all that and um some of the guys that were there uh actually came up with uh what was the skeleton of the chorus of move your body right and um that we were we were traveling a lot so we were we were not um in studio very often maori was more than we were because uh you know being the uh the the head uh, writer and and um, an arranger he he was the one mainly behind you know uh, the bolts and the knobs of getting things you know on on their feet production wise speaking and and, and being one of the main main uh, arrangers and and writers but we were having pitches from from the other guys there and this was one of them we started working on the track. Um, we really liked the chorus part, but it was hard because it came in with the Move Your Body title. And uh, I had to fit the lyrics into one of the ideas that I had. Because uh, at that time, I was into really some mind-blowing ideas. Um, like the fact that if, if you would look at your hand, it's not really there. You know, like your hand is made up of atoms that keep on racing around each other so much that give you the illusion that it's solid but it's not 
because it's not. It's always a certain amount of atoms at that point where you're touching it that gives you the illusion that it's there, but it's really not that solid. So that brought me into a mind state where I was thinking about the universe and where things stops and how small we are and how big things are. Um, and that got me to writing the lyrics of Blue, which, you know, it talks about how people conceive the world. Uh, blue means that... Um, I think that as a metaphor, every one of us have a filter that you can see the world with. And it's your filter. It's nobody else's filter. You, you do everything with that, with that filter. The people you choose, the way you live your life, uh, uh, the, the things that you do, and then the people you surround yourself with, it's all part of that filter. So I, I did a metaphor of that. And, and, and we were writing things like that, you know, like really big concepts behind what seemed to be uh, cheesy, easy dance song tunes and move your body was talking about um the fact that if you can dance along with other people then you can probably do a lot of things along with uh, with other people and maybe if you move then probably other people will move and if you do that all together then you can move big things and you can move the world so move your body was a metaphor of using what normally would be the will to join someone dancing into the idea that you can definitely fit in to the, the idea of collaborating. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a brilliant record. And, um, and yeah, another thing that I kind of wanted to, wanted to ask you about was um, you guys did some, did some great remixes for other people. Um, yeah. Are there any that you were particularly proud of? Well, it's hard for me to talk about that because mainly, you know, being Maori, the guy that was behind, you know, uh, the producing part. And I, I mean, we really have to thank him a lot for his amazing talent in putting that into Eiffel. Um, he was the guy that was completely stressed. Poor guy. Like he, he had, I don't, I can't even remember the number of remixes this guy was, was into back then. Um, one of the things that I do remember, and we were smaller, uh, they are cool than the gang fans, right? I mean, I, I liked them a lot and, and, uh, Get Down On It is one of those tracks where you, um, we were often singing that track, you know, trying to sample from it because we went to Daft Punk and, you know, trying to see what they were doing. And when Maui said, hey, you got to listen to this, and he turns on the computer and he opens a, a session with the, the complete stems of Get Down On It. And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe it. You got the stems of Get Down On It by Cool and the Gang. And we, listen, we were listening to, yeah, it was amazing. I, I couldn't believe it. It was like, no, it's like opening a Ferrari and, you know, showing you every part of its, of its motor. It's like, holy cow, I mean, this is what it's made of. And um, that, that was a really crazy moment back then. Um, but unfortunately, you would have to ask Maui more about that because he's the guy that was behind it. Well, that, I mean, that's that alone to, to hear about that experience with Cool and the Gang. That was worth asking. That was amazing. I mean, it was uh, amazing. He came to me. He says, you know who, who, who we're going to remix? And I said, who? The Beatles. I don't, I don't think that ever came out. So I was like, are you kidding? We're going to remix the Beatles? I got I, I to gotta go to the bathroom and slap my, my face about two or three times because I can't believe it. I think I got to wake up. Uh, I grew up with my dad listening to the Beatles. Um, so that, that, was, that was amazing. Uh, we were doing uh, a lot of things, and uh, it was hard to keep up with it. Yeah, I mean, it must have been a hectic time around then because you guys were, were achieving Crazy. so so much. Um, I, I've got one final question for you, which is, out, out of all, all of the things in your career, all of the tracks that Eiffel 65 have made, um, is, there, is there a song that you feel is as good as Blue or, or, or you know, Move Your Body? um that that maybe is has been overshadowed uh, like a deep cut or a, or a lesser known track that you think okay you'd like the listeners of, of my podcast to check out uh, more than any other well, well that that's 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 almost impossible to answer um back then if you would have asked me that question i probably would have been talking about too much of heaven which is one of the tracks that i really like um that, that album that i often listen to uh, I, I like what the meaning of the song is. I also like Now is Forever because that has a nice meaning to it too. Um, very electronic, very Depeche mode kind of style. Um, but, you know, Blue, it has a life of its own. I, 
people are talking about it as an evergreen. I mean, maybe that's the case. I don't know. Um, obviously, being the guys that, that, you know, did it, it's hard for us to, you know, step back and really look at it that way. But um, it's so hard to actually compare anything to Boo for the simple fact that it, it really just stepped out of what can be a normal, you know, life and death of a song and, a, and of a, of a genre. Cause it, it seemed that it was so part of, you know, the dance music scene of the times. And then often what happens with dance music is that, you know, they, they kind of like get washed away with the genre, right? When it changes, you just don't listen to that anymore. But um, uh, what we did, back then and we we still do and we still believe in is that if the music itself has good roots then no matter what kind of suit you put on it it's always going to be good and um investing most of our time in getting the right song and putting the right melody and and getting that fit in and you know and maori worked so hard on that that we actually we came across this in, in incredible combination of things uh, guided and, you know, uh, brought to life by the, the melody itself that basically any other song in the album has the same kind of roots, but blue just stepped out and, you know, made the difference. <laughs> 